Hello, and welcome to part one of lecture 26. Um, here, I'm going to be talking about elasticity, stress, and strain. I'm going to be introducing some key terms and showing the formulas that are relevant to these topics. In the follow-up lecture, so that's part two of lecture 26, I'm going to actually solve some examples of stress, strain, and force to fracture, and so on. Okay? All right, so let's jump right into our key terms. Our first, our first key term is the Young modulus. So what is the Young modulus? Well, it is a material-specific quantity that relates force to change in length. It is very similar to the spring constant, but unlike the spring constant, it's not specific to an individual spring, whereas every spring has its own spring constant, but instead describes an entire material. For example, rubber would have a young modulus, or glass would have its own young modulus, okay? And it does refer to, as we'll mention this in a moment, the linear region of a stress-strain curve, okay? And it pertains to pictures like these. So in other words, tension and compression. More on that in just a moment, okay? It is also called the elastic modulus, and you may, you may hear me calling it, calling it that quite a bit. Take a quick note of its units. It is a newton per square meter, so it's a force per area. Compare that to the units of the, of the spring constant, which was newtons per meter, force per length. What we've done here is we've divided force by cross-sectional area, thus normalizing the force to area. That's why we don't have to worry about the size of the sample of rubber or glass or whatever it may be, because we're divided by the area. We've effectively divided it out, okay? The next type of modulus that refers to materials changing their shape, because of course, as we're talking about things about here, things being stretched, strained, changed in shape, compressed, okay? And that is the shear modulus. Shear is a type of motion where um, the motion is perpendicular um, to the cross-sectional area, okay? And the shear modulus is a material-specific quantity that relates shear force to shear extension, okay? But that, that's what I was referring to with that, that perpendicular nature. What exactly is shear force in shear extension? Okay, we'll take a look, okay? So the idea here is that unlike the, an elastic process like tension or compression, Shear, so that, that would be the actual phenomenon, shear, is where the force is perpendicular to the area. So if I had a vector representing the normal direction of the area, you see that the force is perpendicular. Whereas with tension compression, the force and normal vector are along the same axis, okay? They're either parallel or anti-parallel, okay? But here, always 90 degrees with one another, okay? Notice the type of motion turns that solid cube into some sort of parallelogram, okay? And the idea there is that you're kind of pushing it to the side. Imagine like you would with a book, okay? And this is, as I mentioned, this is material specific. So, you know, any material, wood, glass, so on, rubber would have a shear modulus. And you can imagine that a material might not have the same young modulus as shear modulus. It might be more prone to shearing or less prone to shearing as compared to tension or compression. Then we have the bulk modulus. This is another material specific quantity that relates pressure to change in volume. Okay? Um, this is where the whole thing is getting compressed. The units of the bulk modulus are also newtons per square meter, which I'll add in at the end of the video, okay, before I upload these notes. Okay? So then we want to take a look at two other terms, and that's elastic versus plastic. So to discuss elastic and plastic and their meaning, we have a very ubiquitous, very important graph in the study of statics, and that is the stress-strain graph. Stress is on the vertical axis, and this is force per area, so that would be the same units as all the moduli, okay? Because that's what the stress, the, the modulus is representing the slope, which I'll, I'll, I'll point out in just a minute, okay? So the yellow region is simply the elastic region, which is linear, okay? just like Hooke's Law is a linear relationship. If we're going to be using a particular modulus, we're assuming linearity, okay? If we're, if we're in a nonlinear region, which I'll mention in a moment, then we cannot use 
a single value to represent the slope, there'd be some more complicated fitting function for the curve. Okay? All right. So elastic is reversible deformation. So in addition for, to it being linear, it is reversible. If you stretch something, it will return to its original length. And that brings me to the horizontal axis, which is strain. Strain, this axis has no units. Okay, so it's a dimensionless axis because it's change in length divided by length, or meters over meters. Okay? So it's just, you could think of it as a ratio of how much longer or shorter the um, sample is. Okay? And so, past, excuse me, past the plastic region is the, or past the elastic region is the plastic region, which is a permanent deformation process. So if an object is being deformed plastically, it's not going back. Okay? Notice that when you transfer from the linear elastic region to the nonlinear plastic region, there is a yield strength. More on that in just a moment. Okay? All right. Tension and compression are changes in length. They refer to the pictures up above. Now on to some topics that further explore the stress-strain graph. That's yield strength and ultimate strength. Yield strength is, is a stress value at transition from elastic to plastic. Okay, so yield strength would have the units of the vertical axis, which have units of stress. Okay, so do notice though, right, that the units of stress are the same as the units of the moduli. And that's of course because the slope, rise over run, is just stress over something that has no units. Okay. The ultimate strength, on the other hand, is the greatest stress value on the material. Okay, so in this case, we have the ultimate strength as shown, um, and that would also be the rupture. The rupture could actually happen at a lower value of strength because some materials be, maybe become less, require less stress before they break, as they finally start to give way. In this particular case, rupture and ultimate strength agree. They're not always, they, rupture could, for example, like I said, be lower, but ultimate strength could never be less than rupture because by definition, it is the greatest value, the greatest vertical value of your curve, okay? So the, pre the breaking point is the stress value at rupture, okay, as shown. Okay, and again, not always equal to the ultimate strength, although equal in this particular diagram. Finally, there is toughness. Toughness is the amount of energy material can absorb before rupture. Okay, so how, if that's energy, how would that be represented in the graph? Well, it turns out that it is the area under the stress strain curve. So, for example, this green shaded area, if we were to find the total value of that area, that would give us our toughness, right? That would give us the value of our toughness, okay? So hopefully um, that all makes sense, and you can see the real utility of a stress-strain curve. There's an example in the second part of this lecture, the second video for this lecture, where I explore the stress-strain curve in a particular example. All right, so let's flip to the next page and take a look at our key formulas. So the first key formula is the formula for the Young modulus. Okay, so over here is F over A. This is force per area, okay? And this would be the cross-sectional area that is parallel because we're talking about tension or compression because that's where we use the Young modulus. Okay, the force, and here it is, the elastic modulus represented by E. So the name elastic does make sense. You will sometimes also see it represented by uppercase Y. All the moduli will always be uppercase, why would also make sense if you're calling it the Young modulus, all right? And then right here, we have change in length over original length. So you can see if I divide both sides of the equation by delta L over L naught, I get F over A over delta L over L naught. Well, of course, that's just rise over run because this is the vertical coordinate, that's the Y value, and this is the X value. So clearly, E is the slope, okay? Y equals MX right here, okay? So moving on, we have the shear formula. Okay, so we could call this the elastic formula. We could call this the shear formula, all right? And here again, we have stress, force per area. Then we have the shear modulus. This is represented by uppercase G, don't know why. Okay, change in length over original length, so nothing new to label there. Finally, we have the bulk modulus. With the bulk modulus, it looks a little different on this side, and that's because it's makes sense to think of it as pressure rather than force per area because here, the very definition of pressure is that pr pressure points in all directions over the entire surface of an object. That was not true when we were talking about compression and tension and shear. Those are particular forces that might be created by some contact force other than that of a liquid, other than that of a fluid that would lead to the definition of pressure. So the point being that this is truly pressure, 
We wouldn't want to call it anything else. But it is also not a topic that we're covering in this particular class. So you will see fluids in a later semester to kind of maybe make, make more sense of that. But there is an important note here is that pressure is measured in Pascals usually, but a Pascal is exactly one Newton per square meter. Well, there you see it, right? It is indeed Newtons per square meter, okay? The negative is because the volume will always decrease. You cannot, there's no equivalent to tension you know, for extension equivalent of bulk moduli. We're assuming that this is fluids pushing in. This is not the idea of something expanding from the inside. This is compression in. So the negative represents that. And then we have a change in volume of original volume. And this is because, the reason that I want to explain the negative a little bit more, the bulk modulus, okay, is going to have units of newtons per square meter, okay, same units as pressure, okay. So sometimes, every so often, if you look up any of these moduli, by the way, on the internet, you might see them listed in Pascals. Don't be thrown off by that. Those are the same units, newtons per square meter. But the bulk modulus has to be, since it is a coefficient, a material-specific coefficient, it, I shouldn't say it has to be, but it is going to be a positive value. Well, if you look at change in volume of original volume, this is always going to be a negative. There's always going to be a negative value here because the volume will decrease. Okay? And that negative times a negative will give you a positive B. All right. So that's the last and final bulk modulus. And we have, I'll have an example where I'll show something getting compressed as it goes um, underwater and the, you know, the ocean pressure becomes greater, things shrink. All right. So hopefully the similarity between all these ideas of deformation of solids makes sense and the terms do as well. And please make sure you understand a stress strain graph thoroughly so you can use that graph and make sense of it in any situation. All right. Well, thank you for watching.